Well, welcome everyone back to Student Dream TV. I am your host, Nina Uguomo. And here at Student Dream TV, we are sharing money, investing, and startup tips for the Black Collegian. We believe that wealth and building generational wealth is the key to our success for our community. And so with all of the things taking place in the world around us today, a lot of you are in need of financial advice and of guidance but a lot of you don't have access to that. So what I've taken the liberty to do is bring together some of the leading professionals, investors, entrepreneurs, and leaders around the world and the country to gather here and give you some advice so that you can see succeed moving forward. And today I'm very excited to welcome an incredibly special guest. We've spoken for about 10 minutes right now and already he's given me a lifetime's worth of wisdom. And so I wanna take a moment to just introduce you to the Dr. George Frazier. And so Dr. Frazier has insisted for 40 years that there be no sizzle reel of his life's work and purpose until there was something to quantify and sizzle about. He was born in 1946. Let me say that again. He was born in 1945 in Brooklyn, New York to a troubled family of 11 children. After serious mental health issues with his mom, at two years old, he and six of his siblings were orphaned, then put into toxic foster homes for a total of 16 years. He was not considered to be college material, so he was sent to a vocational high school and got a diploma in carpentry. The rest is history. Dr. Frazier has always believed, it's not how you start, it's how you finish, that God has great plans for each of us. We must simply listen to his voice, follow directions, overcome the obstacles, and stay the course. Dr. Frazier's favorite line from super rapper Drake started from the bottom, now we're here. So here is 75 years of life in 120 seconds. So thank you, Dr. Frazier, for taking the time. I mean, just looking at all those, I mean, your life's work in 120 seconds is, <laughs> is a life's work of, of, of mentoring and leadership lessons that we can take and immediately, immediately apply. But, you know, what do you have to say for that in terms of just what we watched? I think that, um perhaps the goal of all woke, conscious, good, and righteous black people ought to be that the, in the twilight of their years should have a sizzle reel that's about 120 seconds, two minutes, mm. that's worth watching, that would make an impact. Yes. That makes a statement that you did God's work in your purpose for a greater good. As I like to say, it's not about me, it's about we. Mm. It's teamwork to make the dream work. That you're not gonna get there on your own by yourself in a vacuum. You're gonna do it with and through other people. And right. I God, if you are a righteous thinking African in the diaspora, that you will choose to do your work with and through other people that look like you. That's first. I wrote a book 25 years ago called Success Runs in Our Race, The Complete Guide to Effective Networking in the African-American Community. And in that book, I begged black people, <laughs> not only race and culture first. Hmm. Other cultures and races, and there are only three races in the world. You do know that. There is the Black race, white race, and Asian race. Hmm. Black race is the second largest race in the world. The largest race in the world is Asian, 4.4 billion. Black is 1.6 billion. And whites are the smallest in numbers, about a billion hmm. spread out across the world. But they control over $400 trillion of global wealth 
white people or Europeans or Caucasians control the most significant amount and percentage of that wealth. There's lots of reasons for it. And um, white people did everything they needed to do to survive. Hmm. They understood the concept of survival of the fittest. They did whatever it took to survive whether it was enslaving another whole race of people, whether it was colonizing an entire country or continent, I should say, whether it was um, shooting you, killing you, maybe whatever it was, that's what they felt they had to do to survive. Mm. So it's not about us forgiving them as an African sister said in a wonderful little video I posted on my Facebook page, it is really about us going inward and understanding that we, as black people, did not do what we needed to do wow. to survive. That as Malcolm X said many, many years ago, we were tricked and bamboozled wow. by white people. Hmm. All right. Therefore, yeah. after 500 years that African people have given the Western world everything they have, we are still <laughs> at the bottom. Man. They have everything and we have nothing 500 years later. And no matter where I travel in the Pan-African diaspora, whether it is Seattle or Miami, whether it is San Diego or Maine, whether it's Los Angeles or New York, whether it is Rio or Bahia in South America, whether it is the Bahamas or Jamaica, whether right. it is South Africa, Cape Town, or Cairo, Egypt, whether it is Ghana or Kenya, black people, are at the bottom of every single economic statistic wherever they are. Wow. 500 years later, we were tripped and bamboozled. We believed and gave into and bought into the lies and deception of white people doing whatever they needed to do hmm. to survive. That must change in the 21st and 22nd century. Wow. Yeah, I agree. And that's why we're here. You know, that's why. Now, yes, I go ahead. I, 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 I don't want our brothers and sisters thinking it's about hating white people. You don't have to hate anybody to love yourself. Mm, that's good. You see? Yes, sir. So I love me. In fact, there's a problem that we have across our race because when I get up in the morning and I look in the mirror and I do not love what I see Nina there is no way that I can love you because right. when I look at you you become a reflection of me that's called low self-esteem low self-esteem drives low race esteem hmm. that's what we suffer a lack of trust and love and respect of working with and through each other, connecting the dots, leveraging more effectively our collective resources and intellectual capital, all right? Survival of the fittest is not necessarily a singular competitive thing, that I am stronger than you, and therefore I can dominate you, right? I can take what you have, right? That's not necessarily what survival of the fittest is. Survival of the fittest can also mean that those groups and communities that work best together right. win. The football team that works mm -hmm. best together wins the Super Bowl. Right. The NBA team that works best together wins the NBA championship. It's not one player on the NBA team. Sure, they all have stars, but it's a team sport. Building a community, building a culture, building a race, 
race is a team sport. And who are you competing with? You are competing with other races who are doing whatever they need to do to survive, mm. including putting their foot on your neck <laughs> if they have to, including enslaving you so that you will do the hard work necessary that they're not capable of doing or don't want to do, but you do it and create economies, whether it's in America or in Cuba where the Spaniards for 400 years colonized Cuba and used them to do the grunt work to cut down the sugar cane where they had a sugar economy and, and, and mm -hmm. sweeten the world. So we have to man up and woman up. That's the future for us. That's your generations. Have to man up and woman up and do whatever it takes but in a good and righteous way to survive. And we cannot be any longer tricked and bamboozled by the sinister traps that we have fallen for, heaped on us hmm. in, a, in, a, in a Eurocentric world and mindset. We are different people. That is fundamentally what what makes us different than white people. We, mm. There's Eurocentric thinking and African-centric thinking. And we believe in the oneness of all things and collective work and responsibility. It's all in Kwanzaa, it's all in the e Egyptian art, right? So right. we trust we trust that you, you do, will do what you say and that you are honorable. Well, yes. we were wrong. So it's up to us to fix that. Let me say that another way. No one is saving us, Nina, but us. White people will not be saving black people. Hmm. It's been 500 years and we're not saved. <laughs> right. It has been until a few couple of centuries. People, until black people put black people first, black people will always be last. Hmm. So for 500 years, we've been last. That is not true thousands of years ago, 7,000 right. years before Christ, 3,000 years before Christ. You, you go to Cairo, Egypt, which is in Africa, by the way, <laughs> and it was Africans 7,000 years before Christ. It wasn't Arabs. We were building pyramids and solving complex engineering problems when other cultures were living in caves, eating each other. Hmm. White America did not come and pull Africans out of trees eating bananas. That's bullshit. We civilized the world. We were building pyramids when they were living in caves. Mm. So we were tricked and bamboozled. Wow. We hear that kind of stories and those kinds of lies for 500 years. Oof. 500. Right? Yeah. It sort of jacks you up. Yeah. <laughs> so now we understand. And it's up to us to do the work. Let me say that a different way. So this is the challenge for your generations. We are all drinking from wells that we did not dig. Hmm. That we are standing on the shoulders of giants. And if in fact that is true, Nina, the question that we have to ask ourselves, are we worthy of that legacy? Hmm. Wow. 254 year legacy of a fight, our fight for freedom, 1619 to 1864. Are we worthy of that legacy and the books and the movies that are still being made about the 12 to 13 generations hmm. that died for our freedom? Are we worthy of that legacy? Wow. Are we worthy of the legacy of civil rights, voting rights, and public access from 1864 to 1964 and the five generations that it took to achieve that? 1964, the, the civil rights laws were signed, then the Voting Rights Act, then Fair Housing Act. Right. Overcoming Jim Crow and Black Codes, 
five generations worked on that. The baby boomers are the last generation to have worked on that. Wow. Because those are the legacies wow. that we must ask ourselves, are we worthy of? So if in fact we believe that we're worthy of that legacy, the next question, Nina, for your generation is, what will your legacy be? Hmm. What will the legacy of generation X, Y, Z, and generation Alpha, the children of the millennials, what will their legacy be? It can't be civil rights, voting rights, and public access. You weren't wow. even around. It damn sure isn't a fight for freedom, right? We weren't even around. We, my generation wasn't even around. So what will be the legacy of those four to five generations of young people that we are preparing wow. to pass the baton? That's what you young folks need to be thinking about. What will be your legacy? If you put together a sizzle reel on those four generations, what would that 120 seconds look like? Wow. Now, that is the ultimate question that your generations are going to have to answer. There are a couple of things I like about the younger generations. You are unapologetically black. <laughs> I love that. Unapologetically black. You don't, you don't think we saw that in previous generations? No. We were not unapologetically black, darling. Even as baby boom, we were trying to be white. Are you kidding me? And it was only a simple reason we were trying to be white for survival. So we were wow. acting like white people. We were speaking like white people. We were dressing like white people. We were imitating the core values of white people. It wow. was a survival thing. Y'all don't buy that. You're unapologetic. Wow. Yeah, I love that about you. Thank but you. I don't know if that's a legacy. I love Black Lives Matter powerful movement. That'll be some part of your legacy. Hmm. But I don't think that'll be, that can't be the whole thing. And it can't be rap music. Hmm. Right? Now, there is some incredible evolved rappers and rap music. Kendrick Lamar, the only rapper to win the um, no Pulitzer Prize. Oh, Pulitzer. So there's some really good stuff coming out of young minds around the poetry um, of our lives and the storytelling of our lives. But there's a lot of bad stuff. Yes. A young person asked me at a talk that I gave at FAMU, Dr. Fraser, what happened to black people? <sighs> and I said to them, I want to say this and still be loved. We changed when our music changed. Wow. You, you know how important music is to us? From the days of slavery. Do you know, it's how we communicate with each other. Do you know how important rhythm is to us? That's just a part of our inner being. So when you start calling yourselves niggas, bitches, and hoes, Oof. you put that to an infectious beat, and Woo. you put your headphones on, and you pump that shit into your brains, for five hours a day? Wow. Tell me what Dr. Francis Cress Welsing said about black people listening to that crap, that you cannot call yourselves niggas, bitches, and hoes and expect to ever amount to anything. Wow. In fact, if you understand, we are the only race on the planet that does it. Wow. The only ones. So we have been reduced in many ways psychologically because we went through a psychological holocaust second to none in the history of humankind. We have been reduced to calling ourselves niggas, bitches, and hoes, disrespecting our women, disrespecting our being, disrespecting ourselves. No other race does that but us. <laughs> Wow. So don't tell me we're not still out of our natural minds. We are a ill people. Not all black people, just most black people. Wow. That's why we are at the bottom of every single economic statistic that matters, certainly in this country. 
Has there been progress? Hell to the yes. Have we, have we developed millionaires? Yes, we have. Do we have some black folk doing good stuff? Absolutely. But it's not enough. Let me say that differently. We have every sing, single thing we need to succeed, Nina, except each other. Thank you.